It's always nice to have a talk on food just before lunch. <laughs> and nobody here in the room is, has any uncertainty about that lunch will come. And that actually when you go home tonight that there will be uh, food and a meal waiting for you or you, have, you can prepare it. And that's not the case for most of the people in the world. And this is why when Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations was asked what was his main concern of the planet in the next, say, 20, 30 years, he said it's feeding the planet. Uh, and uh, this is what you uh, can see here also. Oh. Can you help me a little with the screens here? Um, thanks. Technology. So I'm going to briefly touch upon, because this is a vast issue, about six major points that are uh, threatening our planet. And this is why Ban Ki-moon is actually having uh, think tanks all over the, the place about what to do with food and nutrition. Uh, one of the first is uh, population growth. And, um, you know, it's going to be expected that within a few decades we'll have nine or ten billion people living on this planet. Uh, and that's a main concern, basically also because there's very little fertile grounds and fresh drinking water. And it's been expected that the next wars will be not about oil and about all kinds of other issues, but about, you know, land and water. Uh, so it's, they're going to be very scarce, and we have to be very precious with them. Um, the second is the distribution of food. If you think about the, the world now, and it's changing very rapidly, there are, are about 1.5 billion people who are overweight or obese, and there's 1.5 billion people who are starving and are hungry most of the time. Uh, so there's a very uneven distribution, and actually this even occurs within single countries. So that's the big problem. Uh, the last problem I will touch, touch upon, or the one before last, is food waste around a third to 40% of the food that we produce is actually not eaten, it's wasted. Uh, and for the majority that's not wasted, it's going to be used as biofuel. So there's going to be scarcity of food if we are not careful. And the last point I'm going to talk about is uh, food and health, which is all entangled with all of the previous uh, issues. So there's very little arable ground, agricultural fertile soil is only 30% of our planet and only 10% actually can be used in any uh, degree for food and uh, fiber production. And that's much too little actually, so we have to invent ways of producing more food per area of, uh, of land. And you can see on the, on the bottom here that the population growth is actually accelerating even further uh, uh, from what we are already expecting. So can we produce sufficient food from 0.2 hectare per person? Uh, at the moment it's impossible, so we have to think about technological solutions uh, to this. Are we on the right track? This, this is a quote, I'm, I don't want to be pessimistic in such an optimistic day, but this is, if we don't change our ways rapidly, uh, and this is a quote of Nicholas Freudenberg, who's been thinking about this a lot, is that if we are continuing on the track that we are on, uh, this is going to lead to a lot of uh, health burdens, increasing inequality, uh, rising environmental damage, and deteriorating democracy. So it's not a very um, um, promising future if we are not dealing with this in an adequate way, and very soon. So what is really the problem in a nutshell? Uh, over the past 200,000 years or so, as modern humans have been living on the Earth, maybe six million if you count you know, our ancestors even before that, 99.999% of the time we have been living as hunter-gatherers. So eating what is there, uh, fishing it or hunting it or gathering it, uh, and uh, adapting to climates and new circumstances. So on the top of this slide you'll see the Inuit who are living almost exclusively on animal diets, and below that uh, our African ancestors until 20,000 years or, or so ago, who have been living really as uh, people living from the land, what, what is in their environment. And of course, we all know this, but it's always good to remind us that, that with this population growth, it's not just population growth, but there's all, also going to be a massive urbanization. If you think about 1800, when 
two or three percent of the world's population lived in urban areas. In 1900, it was about 14 percent, and in two decades or so, it will be 70 percent, seven zero. Um, so all these new people coming on the earth will live in cities. Uh, and they won't live in nice environments, they will live in urban slums and environments, as you can see here, in which food production, food consumption, food preservation, food, everything around food and uh, fresh drinking water is a major problem. So how are we uh, dealing with this? And, and we have, of course, moved from our ancestors' diet, which is, you can call that the paleo diet, which is very popular, but it's in, a, in essence, it's just what we've been eating say, 200,000 years or so, uh, and what we've been eating the past 20 years. You know, revolution since the Industrial uh, Revolution and the new technology advancements um, is this. So, um, technology hasn't really helped us a lot in that sense, in the sense that we've been producing poor nutrient-dense uh, foods, high-energy-dense foods, and with all kinds of health consequences as a result. And I will tell you that this, this is not just a problem of the affluent parts of the world, but it increasingly uh, dominates the, uh, the poorer uh, people. So agriculture, we've been benefiting a lot from agriculture and, hus um, and, and, and animal um, husbandry, but um, there are still a, a lot of people living on agricultural diets, which can be very healthy, like, such as this Mediterranean diet. But this is not what most of us are eating. Uh, most of us are eating this kind of diet. Th these are pictures uh, from Peter Menzel, who's been photographing people with their uh, weak loads of food <coughs> uh, in families. And this is the typical Western, westernized European, American, Australian, Canadian diet. <coughs> uh, and it's associated with all kinds of health consequences, as, as you will know. Uh, this is the circumstance now that we see in the urban slums of the big cities. These are a few pictures from uh, New Delhi, uh, uh, made by a photographer, uh, uh, Hofstenge, who has looked around uh, the urban slums in different parts of the world. The big urban areas, Mexico City, New Delhi, Shanghai, you know, Johannesburg. And what you will see is that most people actually have no choice. Um, it's also not the fact that they have supermarkets or anything, they actually don't prepare a lot of food. Most of what they eat is street foods, um, and they live in these uh, circumstances. So the only safe food <coughs> you can eat is actually packaged and, and added with uh, preservatives, or it's deep fried, um, because all the rest is a hazard to, uh, for your uh, health. So these, this is the typical f street foods that you will see that feeds ab around one or two billion people uh, every day. Uh, and this is the food environment in urban slums. So you can talk about eat your salads and vegetables and things like that, but they're not there. Uh, and drink water instead of sugary drinks, they're not there. If you want to buy water, it's three times as expensive as uh, um, soft drinks. So this is, this is the threat. Um, Affluent diseases such as diabetes, obesity, heart disease are no longer the problems of the affluent rich Americans and Europeans. Actually, they are coping pretty well with this in relative terms, but they are a threat to the major uh, parts of the population uh, in uh, the world, especially in the low and middle income countries. So this aside, malnutrition. So these cities like New Delhi, they have the double or triple burden of disease, infectious diseases by overcrowding and poor hygiene, as well as malnutrition, uh, not enough to eat uh, usually, but if they e eat uh, enough, they have uh, nutrient deficiencies. So it's, it's, this is a, a very uh, pressing problem. Um, another thing is food distribution. I talked about production of, uh, Andre Kuiper told you about Borneo, where palm oil is produced at, a, at an increasing rate. Uh, this is produced for us mainly uh, until, until we don't want it anymore because it's saturated and gives us heart disease. And then we, and it's dumped then on the markets in uh, low and uh, middle income countries. So food and distribution is a, is a major problem, a challenge for technology, I would say. <clears throat> so what we preferably would ha like to have in terms of sustainable food production is 
short change. You know, produce the food where it, where it is consumed so you don't waste a lot. You can actually uh, save a lot on production and distribution and uh, preservation and uh, storage and all these sort of things. Um, this is not what's happening at the, f uh, the food systems at the moment. These are really um, uh, long chain value change, complex change of many steps. <coughs> Uh, that make it possible to preserve foods, to distribute them over long periods of time, uh, and to um, uh, consume them in all kinds of places where there's no food production. This is not sustainable. People have calculated this at FAO, UN, and all kinds of other uh, areas. This is not going to help us uh, a lot. So we need to go back to these short-chain values. They are not able to feed everybody in the world, but they, they'll give you a buffer. Uh, people have calculated that actually if you do local, uh, uh, have local food production uh, and there's a dependency upon what the uh, land is going to be used for, the prices of food, um, the uh, use of food for biofuel and things like that, there's less dependency. So for the major calories, you will have to have major production uh, and intensive production, but for the buffers in, the, in that system, you need short-chain agriculture as well. So there are um, farms. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, but Ban Ki-moon opened last year, 2014, as the year of family farming. H whom of you did know that? Yeah, a few. Four or five, maybe. Um, so that's been very important. So Ban Ki-moon and the UN are uh, pushing, um, and, and as is the case, uh, last week in the World Economic Forum in Davos, also to have city farming, family farming as a means of existence. But how are we going to do this for 9 billion uh, people? It requires technology. Uh, and why would you like to have urban agriculture? Well, it enhances, as I said, urban food security, nutrition and health. It creates also urban job opportunities because most people in urban slums don't have any uh, work, uh, paid income or anything uh, else. Uh, generation of income, uh, especially for these poor groups. And they also are contributing to increased recycling of uh, nutrients because you can actually use the wastage for, as, as a uh, fertilizer for your next crop. Uh, it faci facilitates also social inclusion, and Mrs. Ardenna uh, talked this morning about including everybody, uh, and that's very important. This is not happening in these big urban sprawls. Uh, faci facilitating social inclusion of disadvantaged groups and community development is going to be helped by urban agriculture. Urban greening and maintenance of green open spaces is also something. We are doing research at the VU Medical Center in which we see that actually mental health is improved very much by having green spaces, not just the food, but just having green areas in your cities. It, it relaxes people, it has all kinds of mental and social effect, uh, effects on uh, urban uh, populations. Uh, but it challenges, of course, because if you think about New Delhi or even Amsterdam or Utrecht, there's not a lot of space to uh, produce food. And so this is where technology comes in. Uh, new production uh, that can be locally uh, adapted, like vertical farms, having things in your own shed, even on your own balcony. This is what uh, is happening now with urban agriculture. It's not the old-fashioned way of having land and plowing and things like that. This is the way uh, urban agriculture looks like. So a lot of people are redesigning cities. <coughs> I've seen pictures of Par uh, Paris and of London and all of all kinds. This is Manhattan. Uh, and somebody calculated that actually there can be a lot of food production. And it's called fooding the city. I'm, I'm not sure if you know about this, but this is an accelerating development in these cities like uh, New York, uh, where uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, green in the future. At least that's the expectation. So this is uh, Amsterdam Avenue in 2050. And actually bright people have been calculating this. This can be sustainable. You know, it actually can feed most of the people in New York. It can be self-sustained. But at the price of that, you need 25 nuclear power plants to operate this. So these are choices we have to make. It's possible. It's livable. It's um, sustainable. Uh, 
but it needs energy, and it won't come uh, only from uh, solar energy. So anyway, this is, this is, uh, this is a, a way into uh, looking future, uh, in, into future cities. I, even now, if you go to New York, now, not today, because it's snow, uh, but if you go on a summer day, on a Saturday, they have closed Amsterdam Avenue and Fifth Avenue just to have a farmer's market. I'm not sure have, uh, who've seen this. You know, that, so there's an increasing amount, so there's no traffic, no taxis, it's just food that's being sold in these markets from local producers. So this is spreading already, and this is maybe a, a futuristic, but I think realistic uh, uh, view of what's going to happen. So redesigning building and production, um, and having foods around uh, food production near to where you are living. It, it's the new hunter-gatherer system, if you like. So the, these are uh, the designers of the future that think about new ways of um, town planning, of urban design, of architecture, of agriculture, and things like that. This is the exciting, uh, I think, area where people will uh, work on in the coming uh, decades or so. And as you can see, it's also much more livable than most of the urban areas that are uh, occurring at this uh, moment. My own field is also in urban agriculture, but particularly on the area it has on child development. Uh, so in Amsterdam we are working on projects uh, which involve community gardens, school education, uh, school farm education projects, local farming, uh, to get children interested in food and nutrition. Uh, I'm not sure if you know how many people and how many children in the Netherlands eat enough vegetables. Oh. How many people, half, half of the children eat enough vegetables? Who says? Sorry? It's less than half. A quarter? 10%? Five? It's, it's one. One percent. So in, in the urban areas of, of Amsterdam green ports, where there's a, a major production of vegetables for the world, um, uh, actually, the, the local consumers don't eat it. Why is that? Because they have been detached from the food that they eat. So there's convenience foods, it's, it's normal to eat packaged foods, it's tasty and they don't like vegetables, they don't know what they are, uh, they have not seen it, uh, they don't know what milk is and where it comes from. Uh, and, and so this is urban area problems. And getting children in gardens actually means, means, means that they are physically active, they are outside, they are doing things together, they are looking differently at the soil and at the growth of uh, vegetables, and they start to like vegetables. This is very easy. If you ask children to obligatory eat um, uh, radishes every morning as a school policy program, they will hate it. But if you have them farming it like, uh, like you see here, uh, nothing tastes better than uh, vegetables. We've, we've seen it and we are measuring it ourselves. So it has a lot of benefits. It's not feeding um, the young people of the future in big cities, but it's giving them another look uh, towards vegetables. So can this be done for all children? Yes, maybe, but you need technological advances also to, to help that. And we know for a fact that students who are involved in gardening are more likely to eat fruits and vegetables. So if you bring that close to people's home, uh, this is where they uh, start liking uh, the better kinds of foods. So food waste. <clears throat> Thinking about how I'm doing with time. Um, this is what, what is uh, uh, spilled now at the moment, lost and uh, not consumed. So this is just a, uh, a figure, but you can see fruits and vegetables, most of it is lost seafood, grain products, meats and milk. So it's a major loss of uh, things. So this is where technology can help us in the future. Uh, bright packaging, other kinds of produ uh, pr production and distribution, uh, but also, of course, having these small chain uh, uh, value change uh, of food production. So this is a major uh, technological issue that can be at least uh, helped also by people who are living in the packaging world. Pa packaging is always seen as being wasteful. You know, it, it's a bad thing to package foods. But actually, it's preserving foods and it's, it's uh, reducing uh, waste. And in New York, there are now restaurants where you can only eat canned foods because it's so sustainable. 
It's, it's just as healthy as fresh foods, m usually, or, or uh, frozen foods, but it's, uh, it's, it's good. Yep, I'm almost there. So food and health. Um, so I, I talked a little bit about the non-communicable diseases, the big chronic diseases. This is what's going to happen in, with type 2 diabetes, which is a major disease in, in our country. We have about a million people with type 2 diabetes. But in the world, this will skyrocket because of these circumstances of food environments and lack of physical activity in urban areas around the world, especially in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but about 80% of all these chronic diseases will occur in poor people in the future. So it is a major challenge. It leads to economic loss of productivity because people with diabetes, they lose their feet, they get blindness, they get kidney failure, they get all kinds of other problems, unless there is a very expensive and intensive health care as we have here, which we cannot um, actually afford in most parts of the world. So, um, it's, we, since the 1920s, we have been driving food production on quantity. And now we have to turn this around to quality of food. So, uh, and that's a major step. It's not being happening. If you see uh, urban agriculture, it's quantity only. Uh, and to increase quality is a major challenge. Uh, just a few uh, slides on how modern technology can help us to look also at the quality of foods that you get the nutrients that you need for your particular sort of set of genes and maybe metabolism. Uh, that's our future of the, the elite of the world, if you like. So you can have all kinds of data, you can monitor your health, you can monitor everything, including your gut bacteria, and exactly know what is going to be the effect of the food you eat within the next 10 minutes and maybe the next two or three years. So new data streams connected with uh, traditional data streams, and this is what they call quantified self data streams, they will give you information to optimize your health. But that's only going to be for a small proportion of the world. And I won't give you a lot of examples, but this is, this is how people already are working with this. You know, they monitor what's happening uh, in their bodies with the food they eat and uh, have, have saliva tests and urine and blood samples all the time. And you can do this on your smartphone, so it, it's already there. Uh, and even people have moved f for further into technological advances and just all the food you eat, this is uh, from a guy uh, in uh, Reinhardt in the United States who is producing a lot of foods just with the right ingredients of, and cocktails of nutrients, under $5 a day. It's not my idea of having a nice meal, but it's, it's one way of technological thinking. You know, how can we produce a lot of food with the excellent um, ingredients? So, to sum it up, <clears throat> we have these six major challenges where um, technology can help us, but we need social technology as well. So, population growth, I'm not sure, you know, it, it's the biggest factor that's driving all of this. Uh, it's very difficult to touch. Then food production, scarcity, fertile f soil, technological solutions are there and may uh, happen for sustainable production, processing, storage and transportation, but we also need to move back to these shorter chain values and urban agriculture just to create that buffer for say, global dependency on, on all these uh, uh, change. Food waste is something we can really tackle with advances in technology in terms of production, packaging, storage and transportation. Uh, and we already know that this is happening at a, at a, at a very fast pace. Um, for food and health, technological advances can be, for instance, by the, improving the quality of food by technological engineering of food production, also by biomonitoring and systems biology, which is the next field in biology, I think, uh, uh, already happening uh, in, in most of the uh, universities. But we should not forget that actually food is also our identity, our culture, and um, you know, sharing food is one of the main things that binds us. So let's not forget that food is not just nutrients and energy requirements, but it is also our way of happiness and living. Thank you very much. <laughs>